So uh, my name is Eric Rademakers. Um, full name that, no middle name, and um, I'm from Netherlands. It starts with Ajax. So Ajax is my, my passion all along and I think I was about four um, when they really started to be very good on an international stage. And I think when I was five, they won the Champions League. And at that point, it was really, you know, in Netherlands, everything was, was booming and, you know, top of the world. And that's really where my love for football, you know, trying to stay up late, I ask, can I stay up late? I watch second half and those kind of things because football's in the evening over there. Um, so when I was five, I wanted to start playing football. But my parents said, no, it's too, too rough still. You're still too young, so not your time yet. So I actually did um, judo. I don't know if that's how you say it in English. <laughs> I did judo for one year, mandatory <laughs> by my parents. And um, yeah, when I was six, I was, I was then finally able to join uh, the football club. So kind of how it goes, even though we're a relatively small town, I think we had about 35,000, um, how you call the people who live in the town. I think we had about seven football clubs, you know, pretty big football clubs, like 500 to 1,000 members. Um, and um, so you just go to the nearest one. You know, my nearest one was actually a club where you split it between left and right. One club was green, SV Cloys. One club was blue, quick, 08. So uh, I joined um, the Cloys team. I was uh, a defender. I think still now there's a certain organizational drive and recognizing things that um you know make me somewhat excel at that point and i was somebody who who couldn't be stopped so a right back overlapping right back typical how we even see it nowadays back then already was a even a way that like a team like ajax used to love to play with players that go up there was a guy from tunisia named hatem trabelsi he used to play for ajax big idol of mine growing up and just go up and down uh, so i scored a few goals here and there not many <laughs> with a few goals on the overlap. So I like to believe I can play some football, but uh, I, th I think I, I better at the coaching part than, than I was at the playing part. I mean, I was, I was lucky and, and blessed that in the Netherlands, a lot of coaches are educated. So because we were a team or a club that played with youth teams at a high level, most of my coaches were UEFA licensed coaches, UEFA A licensed coach, UEFA. I think maybe the lowest one was a UEFA B licensed coach at youth level. So I think, yeah, there were a few youth coaches and I think Marta was the main one who really installed a certain drive and passion to actually go for the best. Even when, you know, you might not be that one that got scouted by Ajax or PSV when you're younger, you still go for the best because there's something when you get that group process to a professional level that, you know, you enjoy. I, I did my hospitality management degree. So um, when I graduated that, a lot of my work, potential work, is, is hospitality all over the world. Uh, I got my degree and a friend of mine was applying for a job in Miami and he was like, Eric, you know, you want to come to the job interview with me? And I said, well, you know, the injury and just watching frustrated. Uh, let me try, go out there and travel for a year and, you know, make some money and get some experience. Went to the job interview. I got the job. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and after a few months, uh, that's when I, I met a Jamaican girl, um, Sarah, and uh, we kind of kicked it off and that kind of went from uh, just a one year fun to a life changing experience. Uh, after the year was finished, we got married uh, and decided to move to uh, Jamaica. That was uh, a step that was, I think, easier for me to take than for her to go to the Netherlands. And I'm not going to lie, I enjoy the culture in the Caribbean quite a lot. Um, I think, I mean, each place has its great things and its, you know, downside, but I, I enjoy it here so far and I think it's, um, might even be a better fit than the, the Dutch culture that's a little bit more rigid and as much as I like that here in this culture, they can be a little extreme at times and, uh, you know, so sorry Dutch people. <laughs> the temperature, I remember when I first reached here, it was uh, unbearable. <laughs> in the night, I would, every morning I would wake up sweating and I say, whoa. I think, I think when I first came here, it was like June. So it was like a, a summer period that I was here. And it's funny because right now, I know it's a lot hotter, but my body get used to it. 
Uh, and even when I go back to Netherlands, even though it might be warm there, I'm freezing because I'm used to Jamaica tiny temperature, air kind of temperatures. When we move from uh, Miami to, to Jamaica, we uh, stay with Sarah's parents. We have a pretty nice house um, over here in Kingston, so we could quite comfortably stay there. Um, but you know, of course, we want to kind of to grow to something more, but it was easy for the transition because you get to a new country, uh, you still have to get settled. So for us not to really have that whole issue of finding a place was, was quite comfortable. I started working actually at a, at a cafe that was owned by our, by our parents. So it, it's a little cafe there for about six months. That's why I really got to know Kingston I, I, because my background was food and beverage. So I tried to run that cafe. I did deliveries all over Kingston with Google Maps and trying to get to know. And this is literally when I just, just reached to Jamaica. I was, I was working right there. So. That was um, my introduction to Jamaica, living there. You hear of Jamaica growing up. Everybody knows Jamaica in the entire world, you know? Grow up and, and listening to Sean Paul, not a clue what he was saying at that time. <laughs> I know now, but didn't know back then. But you know, you're saying Bolt, it, it's... I remember when I, when I first came here, I mean, one of the first things that, that happened is that um, my wife at the time, she linked with her friends who play football and she said, hey, I need some football friends for this guy. <laughs> and uh, within a week or so, I went to football, football factory um, with some, no, one of my best friends here in Jamaica. And I saw Usain Bolt playing football. And to me, it was like, is Usain Bolt? It's like Muhammad Ali. It's just like right here. It's like one of the biggest athletes I ever will see in my life. I remember I was, I think I turned 18 at, at college. So my first year college on campus in Netherlands, I turned 18. And for my birthday, I got a Bob Marley CD because um, I listen to reggae from, from younger old and you know, it's, it's not a, I don't want to say a surprise. I think it's a surprise for everybody in my life that I end up in Jamaica, but uh, I don't think it's that much of a surprise that this culture is where I eventually kind of, you know, find my home. The football really only came in in Jamaica after about, I think three years. A gentleman came to me one day after he saw me play. I was just playing on a field over there. I was sitting there and I said, this guy plays it different. <laughs> different than what I see. Uh, so this was Ashton Blankson and he saw me play and after the game he came to me and he was like, you know, I see how you play and you know where you're from and how you, why you play like this. <laughs> so I tell him, yeah, I'm not from here, I'm from Netherlands and you know, I just love the one touch play, pass and move and non-stop talk and organize and this and that. And so at the time he just started doing the under 14 uh, team at Campion College. So he asked me, you know, I just started coaching some youngsters and I really love it if maybe you can just come for a training session and kind of show them a thing or two. And at the time, I would just move back to Kingston for my work overseas and was, was considering doing something else than the hospitality because I realized in Jamaica, the hospitality is not that fun <laughs> to work in, uh, unless maybe you're an owner. Uh, but so I, I kind of took him on on that, passed by once or twice, and I said, this is all great, but this is nothing more than a hobby. Uh, this is not really something that can, you know, make a living out of it. Um, because, I mean, when you see the, the, the field, I mean, no, we did some work, but still it, it nowhere looks near something that would look professional uh, in my eyes coming where I'm coming from. And then knowing that most of the persons who have interest in football, I saw Jamaica Premier League and I watched them and you know, and I said, there's no money involved here. No money people want to be doing football here. So it's it's great and fun, but nobody really taking it serious. So nobody's investing in it. So I can't make a living out of it. So I have to do this on the side. Um, and then really, we kind of start that dialogue with, you know, is it possible? How would it be possible? With uh, one day, Ashton said, come, we go sit down. I'm going to share some ideas that I have on how it could work big Manchester United fan and he said I want to be able to compete with United youth teams. I see the talent here but there's no professional approach to it. From those early days he very much recognized what are we in here in Jamaica and what should we be and it's not a duplicate from what's happening in Europe because it's a different environment but there are ways that we can get to the same goal. You know a certain control about the player that makes sure he shows up, make sure he's engaged and whatever he needs to be engaged whether it's class or a topic or a match or a tournament or recovery or um, so those kind of things came to the table with a big question how do we actually make this work so we can invest our time in this and that really started now by us approaching the parents and we say it's great that we have this this desire and passion but we need to have 
the parents of players buy in, so they're not actually willing to fund the whole vision that we have behind it. From there, we kind of started off the Campion uh, project. Uh, we had a whole seven year plan together. You know, how can we get recruiting? So we went to fifth graders, sixth graders, had a group of, of talented youngsters, show them what kind of training we would give, what Campion is about. They would Campion as their first choice. And then when the results come out from GSAT at the time still, nobody would get into Campion. <laughs> and we would get one or two persons eventually to join and the dream would crumble down. Uh, of course, we always keep trying to get more footballers in that are Campionized. They have the brains that match. They can manage the, the academic load. Um, and they actually want to come to Campion because some of those persons who academically come to Campion, love football, still prefer to go to a traditional school. So I hope nowadays, you know, with everything that we've been putting in, more and more persons want to go to the school that they actually should go academically and then work with the footballers there. And those that go to Campion, they, they, they have a nice program uh, for many years to come. You know, I have to be careful when I start compare Campion 10 years ago and, and to where it is now. Um, because a lot of this is from hearsay. Uh, I wasn't here at the time. But uh, I do see the statistics, so I one of them that I like to put things in motion. I think it was two years before we started, um, the Campion Manor Cup team had 10 matches in the first round, scored zero goals, conceded 54 and lost every single one of them. Compared to this last year, our Manor Cup team, which really was our, our under-16 team, but our Manor Cup version of that team, uh, was undefeated in the first nine matches. Only lost one against uh, Excelsior in, in the 10th group stage match. This is in a six year period um, that we go from scored zero <laughs> to, I, I don't know the details, but we scored a lot more than we conceded. And you know, it, it, it was really a, a huge change. And then on top of that, um, we win the under 16 uh, whole competition. And that was more than 30 years ago, where I think uh, coach uh, Brian Philpott Brown is the only one <laughs> who was here back then when they still won something. So it, it's 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 funny when you think about, you know, persons we talk to, alumni that are considered big persons in, in the world, in, in Jamaica, big CEOs that come and tell you, say, last time Campion won a trophy, I was a 14 year old boy that was on the team. Sponsors really have been the one that made us get through here. Uh, KFC, uh, Restaurants of Jamaica, with KFC, Andre Roper, Tina Matalon, uh, specifically have helped us straight throughout from day one till now. Not because we were really showing value every day for what they did, but they believed in a, in a, in a bigger vision, long-term vision. Sajikor throughout the years helped us. Mayberry has helped Campion. Uh, I remember we went to USA Cup, our first international trip with Campion. And uh, it was Mayberry, really, Gary Peart that came on and said, we want to help this initiative. And again, maybe on that specific trip, they, it, it not came back with a trophy. But when we look back at it now, this trophy that we win now comes back to that start that we made back then. Um, First Rock, um, Sean Myers up there has always helped us, supported us. And then the alumni. I mean, I don't know how, how many names, but I have to thank uh, Kyra Robinson. But a lot of persons come out and are, I should say, are coming out more and more because they see we're doing something they want to believe in. And it's needed for us because our vision is much bigger than just right here. And so we want that support. We want a big turf field. We want a big turf field. So that, that will be a next one that, you know, people can look out for uh, because we need to keep growing so that we can, as I say, go and compete with Manchester United and not specifically, but on that level when we have those persons here. So I was asked to be an analyst in the World Cup in 2018. So this was the year after we started with Campion. Um, I was at a, at a business party. I spoke to somebody about football, of course, is all I ever talk about. And he was like, why is this guy not on TV? This was the CEO of RGR Gleaner. So the next day I got a call and they said, hey, Eric, spoke to you yesterday at a party and I was talking to him. I forget his name about him. I would love it if you would consider coming on the World Cup as an as a analyst. Uh, so I went in for an interview and they were like, that is it. So 
for 30 days, this was in 2018, I was on TV during the World Cup and I think that got a lot of um, awareness towards um, what we're doing because I got my, my time with Neville Bell on TV and of course I go, wait, in six years we're going to beat you guys. I said in Money Cup we're going to beat them, but actually we beat Georges in the U16 final six years or uh, five years after we um, uh, had that conversation on TV during the World Cup. So, we're still good friends, uh, but you know, uh, that, that gave me more attention and more persons started believing in what we're doing at Campion because you kind of get validated. It, it helps um, the academy, it helps the Campion program. More persons feel something serious going on here and I hope eventually a lot more persons look at it and say like, hey, if we do more like what they're doing, the quality of our youth development will go up a lot. Uh, so that was uh, yeah, a fun part, which eventually now reached to a Jamaica Premier League team approaching me and uh, Arnett Gardens, the, the, the vice president, um, reached out to me out of the blue and said, hey, you know, I, I hear you on TV. I see what you're doing at Campion. I've been watching you and I would love it if you were actually willing to listen to um, what we have to say. So I wonder what do they have to say as a Premier League team and I never coached a senior team in my life. But I went to a training because, you know, no real experience. So I showed the training. They loved the training. The group said, this is great. We want him. Um, but they didn't really met what I said the structure should be. Um, so I passed on on that one. I did think about it long and hard, but I passed on. Yeah, so they finished second to last that season in the Jamaica Premier League and they called me again. As I said, they believed in, in the long-term vision that was matching with how I coach. So it wasn't a new story they were telling me, but they were more able now to say, let us try to work with what he has in mind. There were some, some plans that didn't, fall, didn't come through because of my coaching license that I didn't have at the time. Um, and I didn't get exemption on it. So eventually I ended up at Arne Gardens with coach Paul Tiga Davis, who's, you know, one of the legends in, when it comes to football uh, in, in Jamaica. Um, and so I, I did that now completely different from, you know, the youth football here that is a little bit more uptown with persons that, you know, you kind of know and can control to not really be in, in the jungle, one of the more <laughs> known dangerous neighborhoods in Jamaica with 30 grown men that, that you know, you cuss left and right because they don't run hard enough and they reach late to training and you bench them or you cut them from the squad and so that was a whole new experience but um, I think it comes down to the same thing, football is football and once they realize somebody loves football and shares their knowledge and he has knowledge, they just want to learn and you know kind of learn from each other and, and that was a connection that I think quite quickly I got. I think the trust that I'm all in into trying to help them took a little longer um, but I genuinely think that uh, it, it, it didn't take too long for them to really embrace me, even though, you know, different culture, different, different everything, um, but the same passion. So um, when it comes to my dreams and kind of my visions when, when it comes to um, football and what, everything we're working on here is I really want in the next 10 years to have 10 Jamaicans um, that come through our hands with the academy, you know, maybe even champion play at a professional level in, in Netherlands or maybe Germany, Belgium, but in that area at, at the professional senior level. Um, I also really, when it comes to coaching level now, I would love to really be a part um, and coach the reggae boys to a World Cup. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's part of there in case the coaching opportunities, you know, kind of take over.